Welcome back to Video Explosion. Earlier in the show, I promised you one of our guests, which is Bill Adler. Welcome to Video Explosion. Thank you for having me. Um, why don't you give our viewers a little background um, of yourself and how you got into this? I ended up writing this book because at the time, uh, I was working as the director of publicity at Rush Artist Management. And they included uh, the artists that Rush managed were, you know, Run DMC, Curtis Blow, Beastie Boys, Public Enemy, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, uh, De La Soul, Eric B. and Rakim, EPMD, on and on and on. So I'd worked with these guys for quite a while. And before that, I'd been a journalist. And I'd, uh, also in 87, I wrote a book about Run DMC called The Authorized Biography of Run DMC. And um, I'd always been a fan of Jeanette's work, her photography. And, and uh, I suggested that if she put her books together, it would be, a, if she put her photos together, she'd have a wonderful book. And she agreed, and eventually we sold it. And when the time came and she needed a writer for it, she came to me and said, well, it was your idea. Why don't you write it? So that's how it happened. Um, the first video we showed on the, in our show was I heard that you had some part of that, uh, the new group that's called... Uh, the Disposable the Heroes of Hypocrisy. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm an independent publicist now, and, and I work with them uh, doing their publicity. And... Um, <coughs> Gee, it's an honor for me because I think they're so intelligent and politically they're right on. And, uh, you know, to my way of thinking, they're the, the kind of brightest, most politically engaged, engaged rappers to come along since Gil Scott Heron. Mm -hmm. so, and that that video, which was, is it Language of Violence, did you show? Or, or, um, the Language of Violence. Language of Violence is a remarkable song also because it is the first ever anti-gay bashing song to come out of the rap community. Mm -hmm. These guys are not gay. But, you know, they, they come from the Bay Area and they have a lot of sympathy for the, the plight of gay people. Right. And I think there's a kind of a larger issue here, which is uh, the tendency for men to settle their disputes violently. And so they wrote this song and made this video. Would you say that they're down in the mainstream, like Public Enemy and uh, some of the conscious rappers like KRS, who's trying to bring awareness? Yeah, I think, I think there's a kind of a... There's a, a strain of rap right now that is very self-conscious and politically conscious and whatnot. And my guys obviously are in that tradition. You know, as I said, they, they come from a, a slightly different background than, than Public Enemy or KRS-One. You know, their, their, their musical background is um, the punk rock, the late punk rock of, of San Francisco. They were in a band called the Beatniks. And then also, uh, I think that my guys have a little more formal education than, you know, Public Enemy or KRS One, and, and I think that's evident in their music too. Okay, I want to get a little bit more detail in you. Actually, some more questions about your book. Uh, it's a real nice book you put together. Uh, what inspired you to do a uh, book like this to get started on something like this? My love of the music. I mean, it starts out with, you know, from, from my love of the music and, and my uh, friendship with a lot of the artists and the lack of such a book. But, I mean, the, the, the inspiration for this particular work was Jeanette Beckman's photography. Um, look at that picture of Kane. He's just, yeah. he's beautiful, you know. <laughs> and, and he's remarkable, too, and it doesn't look like, it's not the kind of image you see all over the place either. You know, he doesn't look like John Bon Jovi, and he doesn't look like, uh, you know, these knuckleheads in Nirvana oh, or something. He's not the typical notion of uh, a rock star, and yet he's remarkable looking. He's a star, and, and uh, you know, this book is a chronicle of, of not just the music, but also of, of black visual yeah, style. Okay. So, right now, what do you see how rap is going? Is, has it matured from back in the early... Yeah, I think, I think, listen, there'd be no rap today if it didn't continue to mature and grow, you know, and, and I think that, you know, I, I bought my first rap record in the summer of 1979, Sugar Hill Gang, and, you know, I followed the music ever since then, and, and uh, there's hardly a season that's passed when, you know, some pundit didn't say, well, this is it, it's a fad, it's gone, goodbye, right. you know, bring on the next flavor, but... The reason it hasn't gone away is because it, it remains creative, and, and, and individual artists remain creative. And uh, as long as it continues to do so, then you know the music itself won't fade. I mean, people think about rap in these kind of monolithic terms, but you know, there's a kind of a vast stylistic gulf between, you know, Big Daddy Kane and and uh, Public Enemy and the Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy and Arrested Development and, and Criss Cross. Right. You know, they all happen to rap, but they're hardly interchangeable 
what I think the reality is is that you know kids today don't buy you know they're not indiscriminate they don't say oh there's a new rap record I can tell by his you know by his hat that that's a rapper so I'm gonna go grab that record that's not the way they think they know the artist they know individual songs and that's what they buy and people don't think in terms of rap necessarily they just think what's deaf right. so they're gonna buy a lot of rap and they'll buy what's cool on the R&B tip and what's cool on the rock tip and what's cool on the, the ragamuffin tip and whatnot and it just so happens that you know I don't know if it just so happens, but it, it continues to happen that a lot of the really creative, energetic, inspirational stuff is coming out under the banner of rap. How do you feel about female rappers? I love them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, the idea, how do I feel about the idea of female rappers? You know, I mean, I think it's retarded that there weren't more of them to begin with. You know, I mean, obviously, it's like asking how do I feel about female singers? You know, I mean, shouldn't shouldn't we be able to love Aretha Franklin right next to Wilson Pickett? Well, yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah, I think there are a number of, of uh, female rappers making substantial contributions to the music. So, Bill, when are we expecting the second edition of this book? And what artists are you going to be focusing on in the second one? Well, we expected volume two a while ago. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. We look forward to it. We look forward to a contract. Uh, as to which artists we put in there, I mean, there's, you know, how many, how many worthwhile artists have come out since, you know, January of, of well, actually, that's not true. But it, let me just say this, I mean, this book was completed about a year ago, a year and a half ago, and there's been a whole, almost a whole generation of artists that have come out since then who are worthwhile and people want to see. Mm -hmm. And we might want to revisit some of the artists that, that uh, we shot for this book, and then there were artists, you know, notable artists from the first and second generations of rap that we didn't, we couldn't get to. I mean, where's Spoonie G in this book? How much do I love Spoonie G? There's no Spoonie G. You know, where's Houdini? Right. Um, you know, we'd, we'd certainly go back and try and, and grab them this time around. Okay, Bill, it's been nice having you on the show. It's been nice being on. Okay, and this video we're going to go to is uh, from MC Choice, HIV Positive. And Bill, tell them what, where they can see this video. Video explosion, y'all. Okay, and DJ Finesse will be in the scene to ask Bill some more questions about the book. So check it out, HIV positive. Bring it on. on. Video explosion. <laughs> back here on Video Explosion, uh, DJ Finesse uh, back here with Bill. And Bill, um, basically I'm looking through your book here. I really like this book. It's a great book. I also read um, Tougher Than Leather, yeah, the autobiography of Run DMC. It you. Yeah, um, well, I kind of grew up on Run DMC, uh, Houdini, LL Cool J, the Beastie Boys. So to me, those were the first major acts that I was influenced, influenced me. But uh, so I, you know, I felt I had to get the book, uh, being all that Run DMC has done for rap music. No, very, very scholarly of you. And um, had, could you tell me a little bit about the research for the book? Well, you know, it's, it was, um, I'd done a lot of the, uh, the research by the time that I wrote the book. It was, you know, I'd, I'd worked with them. I wrote the book in, you know, January and February of 1987. And by that time, I'd been working with Run DMC for three years. And I keep extensive files, uh, press clips and photos and important documents and whatnot. And I, t I took notes as well. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a writer and a journalist. That's my background. And I understood that even as I was working day to day, uh, you know, selling one record or another or concert or another, that we were making history, that we were making American history day by day. And so I held on to the important documents. And when the time came to write the book, I had all these files and I was able to open the files and it would jog my memory. And so I sat down and knocked it out. That definitely, uh, that was history in the making because, um, like I said, I often reminisce about your youth your long gone youth uh, well well i guess it was a while ago 86 was a big year for hip-hop i feel especially at the raisin hound tour and uh, the big push it got and uh, a lot of media coverage and press conferences television you know soul train uh, right arsenio joan rivers goes on and on and uh, even mtv at the time and uh that's what grade were you in 1986 10th grade See, oh gosh, if I can remember. Ninth grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Wonder Years. <laughs> we were just a youth, a but, raw youth. <laughs> but in '86, I remember it's going downtown. All you heard out of the radios and systems was Run DMC and Houdini, LL. I mean, 
it's, you know, my Adidas, Peter Piper, Funky Beat, One Love, that's all you heard. And um, now, uh, it saddens me a little bit that, well, you know, times do change and, you know, nothing lasts forever, but I still like those groups a whole lot. And uh, it seems like they're, well, kind of in a struggle now, or, or you kind of wonder, you know, will they come back and, you know, do another record, or are they going to get backed up more, or, or what are they going to come out with? Well, I'm, I don't know if I can answer for sure. I mean, I know that Run DMC are preparing another album right now, and, and I think they understand that uh, they ought to, they got to come correct this time, or they may not get another chance to make a record. You know, uh, the record business is harsh and competitive and, and unforgiving and whatnot, and, and, you know, you have to stay on top of the game pretty much or get out of it. And, uh, but the guys in Run DMC are competitive and, they, and, and they're working hard and I know that they will do something commendable next time out. I wouldn't be surprised if their album comes out this summer, although I don't know that for sure. As for Houdini, you know, those are, you know, some wonderfully creative guys also, I think. Uh, they had a particularly good situation with producer Larry Smith. You know, Larry, yeah. La Larry was instrumental in their success, I think. Larry also worked for DMC on King of Rock and Rockbox, right? That's I believe. Exactly right. The first two, the first two Run DMC albums were co-produced co by Larry Smith and Russell Simmons. Yeah, so you know, Larry's a, Larry's a uh, Houdini had a very kind of cool, creative cabal working for them at the time. I mean, you know, they, they, they were the guys themselves and Larry on production and Russell in management. And that was a pretty dynamic group of people. And now that that's not the same anymore. I mean, the guys in Houdini, of course, are left with their native creativity and whatnot, but they're not managed by Rush anymore. And I don't believe that Larry is producing them anymore. And uh, they're looking for a record deal. And they're looking for management, I think. And, and you know, if and when those two elements come together, you know, then there will be another record, I'm sure. Because mm -hmm. uh, I bought their tape last year, the day it came out, because I'm a Houdini fan. I said, I made a goal to myself, well, I'm going to meet these guys, because I've liked them since, you know, 84, 85. I'm going to meet them. This was about March of 91 when their last tape, uh, Bag of Tricks, came out. And then that June, almost a year ago, you know, I heard they're coming to the pier um, for a, a fair, and uh, you know, I met, I talked to Ecstasy, and they're real down to earth. Grandmaster D. Jalel got pictures, and uh, you know, it's just important to me that you know times change. You know, I'd like to see the earlier groups get to, you know, get have the their props. yeah, and sometimes the, those groups are forgotten uh, by some people. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons that we we put together a book like this is because you know we understood that you know it had been history, and yet nobody had stopped at any given point. There hadn't been a lot of books. And that's why Jeanette's contribution is so remarkable because she'd been taking photos of you know the key rappers since 1982, and so this book is a kind of a visual history, not just of the music but of of you know styles in in African American culture, uh, from the time she started shooting it through the present day. You can see history change, and uh, we think that all of those various changes were valuable in and of themselves and that, you know, if there is no record, if there's no visual record, if nobody stops and writes about it, and if, if it, it's not collected in a book like this, it's, it's hard for people to assess it. It's hard for people to remember, you know. Yeah, I went and saw Houdini at the Apollo in 86. What were they wearing? What are they saying? What they have to say? Well, you know, if you've got a record, you can put a little bit of it together, but, you know, if you have photos as well, you have a taste of their lyrics, uh, you have a biography on them, then you have something a little more substantial than your memory, because memory fades. But this book, it, it's not going to fade quite as easily. I, I can tell. And um, where do you see hip-hop going in the 90s? It's going to go wherever it wants to go. You know, I mean, there, there's, there's always been tremendous variety in the music. There's always been, you know, uh, comical rap, and there's always been, you know, pretty serious political rap, and there's been... Uh, stuff that sounds more like R&B and there's been stuff that sounds more like rock and stuff that sounds more like, you know, the deepest kind of funk and stuff that edges off in the direction of reggae. And I believe that it'll continue to go in those directions and in other directions that we can't predict. Bill, could you um, give our viewers some insight on uh, how some of the management uh, companies work with their artists, such as Rush Management or Uptown, or give our viewers some insight on how they work? Yeah, the manager is, 
the manager's role is really to be the champion booster of his artist. I mean, he's the guy who's got to sell his artist to the label. I mean, he's got a he's he's a middleman, but in a lot of ways. But he's he's a middleman between the label and the artist. So he's got to be able to direct the artist and channel the artist's creative energies and and uh, flesh out some of the artist's ideas. The best managers can do that. This is a good song. That's not a good song. I like this about the song, but I think this part you got to change. You know, Russell Simmons took a look at LL Cool J the first time out, and LL was wearing these he kind of white go-go boots. He thought it was Tila Rock or something. You know, Russell said, no, you better get some Adidas and whatnot, you know. The Beastie Boys came to Russell and they were wearing uh, kind of these Chinese red track suits or something. Uh -huh. and they were trying to be real B-Boys and, and all Russell said to them was, yo, go back to how you came before you came to me. You guys are not black, you're not B-Boys, you know, go back to your t-shirts and baseball hats and your sneaks and whatnot and you're gonna be the Beastie Boys that that kind of way you're not gonna you're not gonna be these fake black kids and so that was you know a kind of a notable contribution I think to their appearance but um, you know, the manager's got to understand the music and he's got to understand the business as well and he's got to be able to fight like hell for his artists okay uh, I'd like everyone to pick up this book uh, rap and uh, real important that uh, we know the history of these rap artists because uh, yeah, rap's here to stay and uh, Video Ex Explosion supports rap fully and Bill would like to thank you for talking with us. Thank you, man. Thank you. Welcome back to Video Explosion and my second guest now who put the photography pieces together in this book, Rap, is Jeanette Beckman. How Welcome you doing? Video Explosion. Hi. Um, my first question, if you can tell our view a little viewers a little background of yourself so how you got started well i went to art school in england and i've been doing photography for a long time and i've done a lot of record covers from everyone from the police to tracy chapman and i was just around in the early days of rap and uh, just started photographing rap artists and that's pretty much how i got started okay myself while i flip to these uh this book here I mean, you really capture the artists and the styles. How like, I've noticed how styles from the early '80s have changed, and you capture the different artists and their and their styles and the hairstyle, the clothing. Um, my question to you is: Were there any artists that really gave you any problems in the photo suit? That gave me problems? Nobody really gave me any problems. I have to say. I mean, you know, apart from. Melly Mel and Scorpio getting drunk and kissing everybody on the set. Mm -hmm. If you call that a problem, it's a pleasure, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So none of the artists has ever gave you any problems. Right? Nobody ever gives me any problems. What about some of the um, some of the sexist groups like um, N.W.A. Two Life Crew when you went on a photo shoot with them? Were there any problems? Actually, I never personally had any problems with them, but N.W.A. When I shot them. I went out to where they were recording in uh, California in the studio, and I just had this idea, of course, because they'd just done that, can I say the word? <laughs> the police. <laughs> At, At the, the police. police. <laughs> song. So I just said, come on, guys, we'll do a picture outside. And we went outside, and there was a police car going by, and I flagged him down, and I said, I have this pop group here. Could you just lend us your car for a minute? Mm -hmm. And the guy didn't even know who they were. So we just stood them against the car and did the shot. Mm -hmm. And they were cool with me. Actually, the one thing NWA did do, which is really a little bit, uh, made me so happy. They asked me if I would do a rap on their record that they were recording. And um, I said, well, OK, maybe. What's it about? And they said, well, we want you to do a rap on oral sex, oh, really? how to do oral sex. I just said, look, guys, I don't think I really <laughs> <laughs> want to. <laughs> I don't think it's really for me. Mm -hmm. They were like, come on, come on, that English accent. I was like, no, it's OK. So um, earlier, Bill was in the show. How was it working with Bill together? How were you? Was it good friendship and then what Bill together. and I are old friends in fact I did the first LL Cool J press shot ever the first picture of him mm -hmm. Bill had I'd met Bill through going over to see Rush and um, he brought LL to my studio and that was where we met mm -hmm. and we were just we remained friends we just worked really well together and we kind of think the same and uh, 
he was great. He was a great guy. We talked to each other every day, and we kind of decided what artists we would put in the book, and you know, it was really cool. People he didn't know, I knew, and stuff. So it worked out really well. Okay. Um, were there any? My question again is: Was was there? Did you have a hard time trying to photograph any of the artists here? We had a hard time tracking them down, yeah, right. I must say. I mean, there are a lot of artists that we wanted to include, like Houdini, right. that we just couldn't find. I, you know, I really wanted to have Sylvia Robinson in the book, because Sugar Hill, I mean, so important, but we couldn't find her. And I was just really lucky that I went to the first rap mania, and we happened to bump into Cool Herc. I just saw this guy who looked really great, and I said, oh, could you step onto my set here? What's your name? He goes, Cool Herc. Cool Herc, the Cool Herc got his picture, and that was just a piece of luck. But you know, a lot of the early rappers just aren't around, Spoonie G and so on. We couldn't find them. All right now, I want to share, I want to show the viewers to see what kind of work you did. You did like record labels. So yeah. This is basically what um, Jeanette's been doing. Um, she does good work. We have Houdini here, she does a lot of record covers. Curtis Blow. And Sonic. Dana Dane. This, this is one, one of my favorites. favorites. Yeah, it's very colorful. I like this. It really worked out well. Plus, you've got everyone in there. And Cash Money. Yep. Raw Bass. Really cool. And DMC, one of my favorites. Okay. Salt and pepper. Yeah, this I think this is quite a famous picture, and I really like it. The girls look really great, mm -hmm. and they had great hair and makeup. And this definitely started this whole style thing with the jackets it's and the hats. Nice. Was like a major thing. Everybody was dressing like that. Okay. UPMD. Yeah, with those hats. That was another big style. I think they pretty much started that, didn't they? Yeah. UPMD. They were, they were good guys. It's one of my favorite guys in yeah, Gangstar. They're great. This yeah. was their first photo session, mm -hmm. so they were they didn't seem too nervous. They're kind of low key guys, so they're good. Morning love. This is Moni. She has her own fresh style, uh -huh. I think. <laughs> Nobody looks like that. Daisies. Yeah. It's very cute. Mm -hmm. It's really good for her. Her music's sweet. And main source. His main source, these guys really didn't want to do photos that day, but they wound up having fun anyway. We just went out in the street. The whole thing must have taken 15 minutes. You put everything that together. That was it. Yeah. Nice. Got these artists to put it together. They yeah, look pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So, Jeanette, what are your future plans? Well, I'd like to continue doing record covers, and last year I directed a video for the UMCs, the Blue Cheese video, and I'd like to do some more directing and, you know, try and get into the moving image a little bit more. So what advice would you give a younger viewer who's, or anybody who's interested in uh, photography, who want a career in photography, what would, you, what would you give them words of advice and what to prepare for? Well, I think it's probably good to go to school and learn the basics, buy a camera, it doesn't have to be something expensive, go to school and then maybe work as an assistant, you know, like a photo assistant for the type of, if you want to do fashion, try and hook up with a fashion photographer and work work around the studio. You learn a lot like that. And then just try and get some photographs together and go out around record companies or magazines, whoever you want to work, and try and get some work. Just like select yourself. Really yeah, good. exactly. It's like a portfolio. Uh, and you, exactly. You don't need to spend a lot on a camera. Just, you can get a cheap camera. It's all in the eye. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Enjoy your work. You did an excellent job on this book here, Rap. Thank you very and much. I wish you luck in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. But time's run out. I'm Patrick Farrell for Video Explosion. Till next time, peace out. Get this book if you can.